Today in this video, we're going to talk about what's in the CB350, why is it like it is, what does it promise for you when you're out riding it on the street and should you be thinking about the CB350 instead of the Royal Enfield 350? One good reason to start is it sounds exactly like the 350 but more refined. Konnichiwa Pidi Ami, Ogen ki desu ka? Asa power drift no CB350 wa mito arimasu. Most of you didn't understand anything I just said because, well, obviously it was in Japanese and that's one of the ways that Honda keeps its secrecy together. Most manufacturers are wary of Honda because they're so large, so powerful and they make such good motorcycles, such accurately positioned motorcycles. And today, we're going to talk about the new one and that would be the new Honda CB350. We're not getting to ride one today though. We're just going to talk about what this motorcycle promises to do for you when you get to buy one in about 10 days time. Subscribe to Power Drift if you haven't, leave us a comment on the motorcycle and I'll tell you what all we want to know from you before we are done with this and hit the bell notification so that when there are new motorcycles like this, you don't miss out. And now let's focus on the Honda CB350. Now, as you can see, I'm already reluctant to call it the Highness because I think Honda didn't really have a choice because could they have called it the Aristocrat but they can't right because that's a whiskey. Could they have called it Majesty, they can't because that's a Yamaha scooter and if you start looking at it, the word Royal itself is taken by you know who. So that's why you get this little red badge here which says Hness, which is short for Highness. Uh, but the only person who you can call your Highness on this show would probably be me. But Shumi is good. So the Honda CB350 was created to take on Royal Enfield and it's fairly obvious because almost every feature on this motorcycle comes from that source. Let's start by talking about the engine and the bore and stroke is almost exactly the same as the Royal Enfield 350 and that's not an accident. It also means that the displacement is approximately the same. In fact, the power and the torque figures are also approximately the same. They are more than the Royal Enfield by 1 PS and 2 Newton meters, but they arrive earlier in the rev band. So 30 Newton meters of torque is at 3000 RPM. The horsepower arrives at 5500 RPM and that's probably why the CV350 does not get a tachometer. But we'll talk about the meters in just a minute. At the bottom of the engine is a counterbalance, so we're not expecting vibration to be one of the things that Honda aped off Royal Enfield. There's a five-speed gearbox, and honestly, you don't really need a six-speed gearbox on a machine like this, where the rev limit is really low, power and torque arrive really early in the rev band. A rev counter and a six-speed gearbox, both I think are slightly superfluous in a package like this. But Honda did give it a slip and assist clutch. Don't think of it as a slipper clutch as much as a way of making the clutch really light, which means when you take this motorcycle out into traffic, expect the clutch to feel really light and the motorcycle really easy to ride. And as you'll see, the easy to ride is a running theme for this motorcycle. Motorcycles that are easy to ride are more approachable for more people. So, we've spoken about the engine, the 5-speed gearbox, the slip assist clutch and that brings us to the fact that it has traction control but it does not have ride-by-wire. Now, ride-by-wire is normally associated with traction control but there is a much simpler, much cheaper way to do it and that's what the CB350 uses. Well, if you're a new rider, I don't think you can be hurt by traction control, it can only support you. And if you're a fast rider and suddenly the road conditions change, again, traction control is a useful asset to have. Worst case scenario, there's a button that allows you to switch it off. So when you see the meters, you'll see a T and a T crossed out. That's not to cross out the thumb, it's a traction control switch. Now, this is the Deluxe Pro model. My point is, the Bluetooth allows you to connect your phone. There's no screen that displays anything, to be honest, but what it does give you is audio prompts of navigation, and you do have a little switch cube that should allow you to control the phone. It also has a small USB port, which I'm surprised to find out is a USB-C port, but it's not a fast charger port. It's only a one and a half ampere port, but at least it's there. I think Honda could have integrated it better into the motorcycle. I don't like the fact that I can see that little plastic nubbin sticking out of the motorcycle so much. The CB350 has a frame because it can't function without one. And it's a nice basic frame and it's 15 kilos lighter than the Royal Enfield. So although Honda has used a lot of heavy materials on this, it's not really that heavy a motorcycle. So if you think about it, one PS more, two Newton meters more and 15 kilos lighter, we don't know what it'll feel like on the road, but it certainly should be more performance and more fuel economy than the Royal Enfield put together. So what you've got is the engine that goes into what Honda calls a hybrid duple frame. Uh, it's a complicated way of saying that the front down tube splits into two and there's a cradle that goes under the engine. It's a very old school way to make a frame, but there's nothing wrong with it if it works and we'll find that out at the first ride. Now, 
To that, they've mounted very basic telescopic forks up front. There's a preload adjustable twin shock set up at the rear. This is how retro motorcycles are made. And I'm really happy to say that at least visually, these cues really work. How they work on the street, we'll find out once we get to ride it, which should be soon. Stay tuned to Power Drift. And again, if you haven't subscribed and hit the bell notification, that would be a good reason to do it. Now, this frame with its basics also has a 320mm rotor in the front with dual channel ABS. You've got discs at the back as well. So in that sense, it's a complete setup. It's a very basic setup, but I can't really accuse of Honda having taken any backward steps and trying too hard to become a retro motorcycle. So all the basic elements are in place. All of that is tied together by styling, which reminds you strongly of the old CB350s. It's a basic thing with a large tank, a big side panel at the back. So it does look like that motorcycle and some of the retro cues are really nice. For example, if you look at the covers on the engine cases, the way the Honda logo has been created, the chrome there, it looks exactly how it used to look, I don't know, 50 years ago. That's beautifully done. The surprise is that the subframe next to it actually looks thoroughly modern. And so uh, it's a little bit of a contrast that is interesting for me. Together, what I'm surprised about, actually I'm not surprised about, most of you will be surprised about, is how large the motorcycle is. Now the wheelbase is only 15 millimeters or something longer than the Royal Enfield, but when you look at it for the first time, it does look like a substantial large motorcycle. And I think the only trick that Honda's missed is that there are a lot of air gaps on this motorcycle. So if you look through the motorcycle, here at the front fender, around the engine bay area, there's a lot of air which I wish was filled in with stuff, so it would make the motorcycle look even more substantial without really changing the functionality of the motorcycle. But that aside, it's a Honda. I mean, the quality of the paint, the way things fit together, etc., is very good especially from the perspective of Royal Enfield, although to give credit to them, they have also come a long way in terms of how they manage their quality. But this feels like a well-made quality motorcycle with a distinctly retro flavor. And there's some nice elements as well as some near misses like that USB thing I was talking about earlier. There is obviously a lot of chrome. So the fuel tank cap, the plastochrome on the mirrors, the chrome bezel on the headlight, the fenders, there's lots of chrome on the motorcycle. In that sense, it looks correct. That brings us to the final few things that are left, which is, as I said, the base model is called the Deluxe, which comes in a single tone color. It has one horn instead of the two on the Deluxe Pro here. It doesn't even get the chrome covers that this one gets. And obviously there's the Bluetooth, which apparently changes your feeling of motorcycles completely. No, it doesn't. And that brings us to the price. Honda is pricing the CB350 at about 15,000 rupees more than the Royal Enfield 350. And the prices are rupees 1.85 lakhs X showroom Gurgaon for the base model, the Deluxe. And if you add the second horn, the Bluetooth unit, and the dual tone paint job, you get the top model, the Deluxe Pro, which is priced 5,000 rupees more at rupees 1.9 lakhs X showroom. These are reasonably good prices, but how good the motorcycle is and whether it justifies its price and has all of those great Honda values, well, for that, stay tuned to Power Drift because we'll have a first ride impression of this motorcycle very soon. Honda is famous for making super neutral motorcycles, which means if you're in a mood to ride fast, the motorcycle supports you. But if you're not in the mood, then the motorcycle sort of fades into the background and lets you get on with riding without really putting too much effort into it, which promises to me an easy city bike and a nice bike out on the highway. But is it any of those things? Do you think it's any of those things? Leave us a comment and tell us. And stay tuned to Parv because soon we'll be riding this motorcycle. Stay tuned also for its arch nemesis, the Meteor 350, which is still out in the wind. We don't know when it's going to be launched, but the battle is clearly going to be pitched. So now there are a few questions that came into our head when we saw the motorcycle, saw the specification and then sat on it and felt it. The first thing that I noticed is that the ergonomics are really comfortable. The handlebars are pulled quite a way back, so you actually sit upright and very, very, uh, I'm going to say royally. But the question is, couldn't Honda have given this more performance? Couldn't it be slightly more modern? Well, there are two answers to that. One, that's what the CB300R is for. And two, when you benchmark a product, the whole point is to go as close to the benchmark and exceed it by a little bit so customers see a little bit of delta value in that. I think that Honda has got, at least in specification terms, spot on. The second thing I noticed is I think Finish levels on this motorcycle are very good, but I think it could stand to improve a little bit. For example, if you see there are rounded edges for these panels, but the frame sticks out there and you can see it as a disjointed sort of detail. And there's lots of these little things all over the motorcycle, which I think could have been resolved further. The third thing I noticed is that there is a small usability issue in the sense that the toolkit can only be accessed if you already have a tool. So you'll need a Allen key to get rid of the seat under which is the toolkit. There is a keyhole on the other side of the motorcycle that just has the battery box and the fuses. The final question is, 
I'm not sure what this motorcycle is doing at the big wing showroom of Honda because there's only going to be 50 of them and I think that's going to happen over the next one and a half, two years, which means no matter how many of these Honda makes, they're not going to be able to match the volumes that Royal Enfield will do because Royal Enfield simply has a much larger dealership network. Should this motorcycle then have been sold at every single Honda showroom? Tell us in the comments. That also means that service will also happen only at big wing Honda showrooms, which again means that service locations will also be restricted, although that network will grow slightly. The final thought I want to leave you with and tell me what you think of this is that as far as I can tell in the Indian automotive market, no product that leads its market has ever been beaten by a competitive product. It simply not happened. To give you an example from Honda, it took the Activa to match the Splendor. No 100cc motorcycle could do it. So what do you think will happen to this motorcycle in the market? Let us know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. This is Power Drift. That's the CB350. I'm the Highness. No, sorry. That's the Highness. Tell us what you think of the name too. Do you like the name Highness?